Hi there, welcome to the latest episode of my 10 minute moan and this 10 minute moan will probably last a bit longer than 10 minutes I'll prepare you just now beforehand <clears throat> and the topic of this 10 minute moan is just a bit of an update on a sort of side project I've had over the last couple of months regarding the trans and the LGBTQ plus I think, right? And since I first started considering what was going on with this um, body, people that I was led to believe, I have spoke to many people, far better placed to discuss the effects of this campaign to normalise trans. Um, people who are far better placed to, dis to talk about it than I am as a 51 year old possible dinosaur heterosexual man. Now, my journey started by complete accident. I've always had some concerns about the trans um, activists and how they conduct themselves, um, but I've never really felt the need to talk out or the desire to talk out about it until, until recently. And that was based on a misconception that I had. And my misconception was there, not by accident, by, but by design. Because those who are driving this campaign, they have extended the letters of the alphabet behind the LGB community. And it's now the LGBTQI+, and possibly even longer, because it's probably about two weeks since I looked up the proper definition. And the people who are driving this campaign want me as a normal person and, you know, sort of Joe Average to believe that it's all one and the same. But a few months ago, I was on a X space and as I often do, if someone's talking and I find them interesting, I'll click on their profile and probably follow them because that's what you do. And I came on to the profile of this man who was talking in a space that I found interesting. And his bio clearly um, described himself as a gay man. But the little banner pro um, picture above his profile photo was, was a bit odd, and I can't remember exactly what it was, but it was sort of depicting a separation of the LGB community and the rest of the alphabet, particularly the T. So I asked the man if he was comfortable to talk about it, you know, because it was obviously there in public. I didn't think it was the wrong thing to do. And he explained to me that the LGB community, major, vast majority, are quite happy with things as in life just now. You know, there's a few different things that might annoy them, but nothing that they need to take to the streets about. So they're, you know, they're campaigning, which probably started well before I seen it, around about the 80s, had been relatively successful and they'd, they'd achieved all, if not the majority, of their goals. And he explained that the root of the LGB campaign was to give gay and lesbian people the same rights I had as a heterosexual person. And they were namely being able to marry, being able to adopt, given the financial security if they were in long-term relationships that I benefited from as a heterosexual man. And those things seem sensible, seem logical, and as long as they're not interfering with the majority of people, then why wouldn't society allow that? And that seemed to be how they got a victory in their campaign. And then they was saying that, you know, being a, a gay person in the, today's world isn't the worst thing in the world. It's not difficult. So that got me very curious because I then thought, well, what's causing this separation and why was it? Why were they put together in the first place? So I started reaching out to people. Um, I reached out to many people in the LGB community to get a better understanding of it. My journeys now took me to talk to people who their four-year-old kids has been in a, a situation in a communal toilet where um, something on, something not very nice happened to them. And then like, why have we got shared toilets? This is obviously driven by the same people that want us to normalise trans. Um, I've had podcasts with a lesbian journalist, Joe Bartosz, who's fantastically knowledgeable, obviously, in the situation, far more knowledgeable than me, and taught me quite a lot of the insight. And um, I recently just released earlier on today, or sorry, late last night, 
um, a podcast where I interviewed a couple who had two children uh, who are autistic, um, attracted to the LGB community through um, the curriculum in Scottish schools and have since declared herself trans and are on a journey just now which has been quite a tough gig. So that's the the journey that I set out on and it's been quite amazing, it's been quite horrific, it's been quite worrying, learning a bit more about something that I perfectly, to be perfectly honest we didn't know much about and I've came to some pretty harsh conclusions which will get me you know, told on my turf if that's something you can call someone who's male um, and um, it'll get me abuse and no doubt whatsoever um, as most people who talk about the subject do but that doesn't outweigh my desire to share what I found on this short but condensed journey into what's going on here. So, I'm trying to get it in chronological order. The the first person I spoke to um, that was talking to me about this the subject was Joe Bartosz, and as I said earlier, she a lesbian journalist who explained to me that for about the last five years it seems to be her go-to topic because so many outlets want her to discuss it. And she, you know, cemented my belief that the LGB community are in no bad place just now and they're quite happy with, you know, the world and how they're treated and I must say even my own um, probably thoughts and the way I deal with things completely alien to the world that existed in the 80s and 90s when I was a youth where if you saw a gay person on the TV it was very strange and you probably didn't understand what their campaign was about and now it's like, okay, you're gay. That's it. it you know, it doesn't, it's not a big topic. It doesn't matter. It's just some people are and some people aren't. So, um, Joe was describing to me how, you know, the process of the campaign of the LGB rights um, and where it got to. And during that time, there was a lot of sort of quangos and charities popped up. And one of the most sort of obvious ones was Stonewall. And Stonewall were seen as sort of trailblazers to get the LGB rights. So when they got to the sort of end of that journey, the natural conclusion of that journey, at that point there's a lot of people involved in this new industry that was to look after the LGB rights. So what were they to do? They could close their doors, they could stop being CEOs, they could stop being leaders and stuff like that in that community which had became an industry. So they actually really needed something else to cling on to. And that thing that they managed to cling on to was trans. Remember that was the first letter of the alphabet that we attached to LGB. Then it became, became LGBT. And the rainbow flag that was a very recognisable and easy to understand uh, emblem of a campaign started being sort of bastardised and things were added to it. And through time, you know, it seems like every week now we have another colour, another chevron, or indeed, as we've seen recently, another shape added to this uh, emblem for LGB rights. So they sort of ambushed that. And since, you know, since that, we now have a whole industry, not on only on campaigning, we, all, we now have an industry um, evolved around, you know, moving people from a perceived male to a perceived female. Whereas, you know, pharmaceuticals, counsellors, doctors, even medical um, premises are all designed and in place to look after this phenomena of trans. Now, <clears throat> I've spoken before about my previous um, interactions with trans people, and there's two that uh, I remember well throughout my life. I may have had trans uh, um, transactions with people who are trans that I didn't even know. So, you know, on, on those both occasions, I was presented by people, presented to people who <clears throat> believed that they were born inside the wrong body. Now, and both been diagnosed with a thing called gender dysphoria, which 
Some people say as a thing, some people don't say as a thing. I'm not that intelligent. I'm not going to sit and decide whether it is or it isn't. All I can tell you is, I know two people who have been diagnosed with it, who I've had um, lots of discussions with. And the first one, uh, was both of them actually, were not in your face. They didn't have to take to the streets tied with rainbow flags and wear, you know, quite revealing underwear and walk the streets and uh, pride marches, etc. They just believed they were inside the wrong body, wanted to do something about it and be happy <clears throat> in their own environment. But that's not what I see now. What I see now is this desire to put it in your face. And I'm not bothered, but I just find it odd. You know, some people say, yeah, you just don't like, you can't cope with it, all that nonsense. Yes, I can. But the people who want to present their transgender in that sort of fashion, I can see very differently from my own personal experiences with people who believe they had gender dysphoria. And that concerns me, because I don't think they're the same thing. So where did we get up to next? I interviewed Joe, done podcast, you know, was received quite well, got a bit of stick and pushback from trans community as to be expected. Uh, around about the same time, I interviewed for a totally different reason, the potential MP for in Fife, um, Alba representative, um, Neil Anvey. And Neil is, and I found this out, after I started um, getting to know him, that he's gay. It just didn't cross my mind. It's not something that I need to know before you know I start talking to people. It's not that big a thing for me. Um, and I had spoken to him several times electronically, and I met him once at an event, and we had a bit of a chat, spent a bit of time together, and it never crossed my mind to ask him if he was gay, because, like, I don't care. I genuinely don't care. And I found out just before I went to interview him because I'd done a bit of Googling to, you know, get me some ideas for questions. And I found out he'd married for about 20 years to a man and he had two adopted kids, right? So that, that's where I, I, that's it. It doesn't mean anything to me. It doesn't bother me. Just part of life. It's not abnormal now. And when I spoke to Neil, I put that very dicey question that a lot of politicians don't tend to want asked and that was what is a woman and Neil was very quick and found it very easy to explain to me his idea of a woman is an adult female and that was refreshing because there seems to be a large amount of politicians who want to skirt about the subject and I think it's a fear it's a fear of Maybe losing votes, or it's a fear of, I don't know, being called transphobic, because nobody likes a phobia attached to their name, which is, again, a notion I find incredibly mental. And um, he was quite happy to, yeah, I think a woman is an adult female. So that was refreshing. And again, we spoke a little bit about his feelings, and his feelings sort of mirrored Joe Bartosz, the journalist who was a lesbian about this whole thing with the transgender attaching itself to another body of people that really don't have much to do with them. So my next interaction would have been when I spoke to women in Ayrshire who her, she went to collect her child at nursery and was told that her child had been sexually abused in the toilet um, a unisex toilet, communal toilet, however you want to name it, unattended, unsupervised, um, by a little boy the same age. And she was obviously quite upset with that, didn't know how to deal with that. Now, a lot of people have attacked me because they feel that that video was done to point the finger at a little kid. No further from the truth. I work in a, as a volunteer with a group of people, which includes about 150 kids from two-year-old up to 16-year-old. I know you shouldn't attack children. I'm well aware of that. I'm well aware of my responsibility as an adult. But the reason that I done the video was because those two children, because I believe both those children need help, was to identify the complete lunacy 
of putting those kids into that situation to start with. Now I ran a nursery some 40 odd years ago and it turns out that I was safer at nursery in the late 70s, early 80s than children that go to nurseries today. Because when I went to nursery school, we had two toilets and we were supervised and we went to the toilet. But in today's new world, this nursery had been designed within the last 10 years to the specification, obviously, that it was requested, and that was to build a facility for kids under five year old, preparing them to go to school with one toilet. I find that notion mental. And the only reason I can find for having that is this new desire to do this across the whole spectrum of toilets. To tick a box to fulfil the needs for a very, very small minority of people, and that is trans activists who are pushing this for a long time. Now, because of their desire to have things in place like communal toilets, those two children, because I believe two, both of them, can be affected by what happened in that toilet. That simply didn't need to happen. Now, there is the, the, the further issue where the nursery had decided that for the independence of kids at four, they wanted them to learn to go to the bathroom themselves, so they were unattended, which I find, I can see some logic in that, but I don't know how you can, can't, do both things by maybe standing outside the door or standing in the doorway and simple things like make sure they wash their hands. You know, these things are quite important when you think they're going to leave that area and go back into the normal sort of play set up and setting of a nursery without possibly cleaning their hands. So you would think for many reasons supervising these children would be not a bad thing and the safety of those children, both those children, would be quite high up your agenda, but not in the modern society we live in today. My most recent transactions was one um, uh, earlier on this week where I interviewed two parents who have got three children and the middle child and the oldest child are autistic. And they, when presented with this notion of LGBT and in particular trans being an option for them, suddenly found themselves attracted to it. And I can imagine how uh, a child who is in a sort of mainstream setting at school might find it difficult to mix and find friends, and that's certainly how their parents described their life at that time. Suddenly presented with this new thing, which has got nice bright primary colours and people who would accept them and be friends with them. And how, regardless of the name of the group or the intentions of the group, how transgender, sorry, how um, autistic children could be attracted to such things. And then set about a journey that's went on for about six years for this family, having to deal with difficult, difficult things. And I believe that their children aren't actually trans at all. They've just been attracted to this thing and, you know, demands for help and demands for um, possible transitions, etc., etc., etc. And that, that, that video just went out... Um, earlier this morning and that identified another issue where the vast majority in the stats, I can't remember off the top of my head, but they were in the video, I think it was about 40% of the children who find themselves attached to these groups are actually on the autistic spectrum and I kind of get that, I understand that, I've dealt with a lot of autistic kids through my volunteering and I understand you know, a fair bit. No, I'm not especially starting it, but I understand how their, their mind work and you know how things can be found attractive and they want in, you know, input, input, input. They process things a bit different from other kids and you could end up finding, well, here's people that are talking to me and quite happy to bond with me and I found that difficult uh, for the first bit of my school life and end up involved in this thing that they may not have normally been involved with. And I find that quite dark, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, and that's not to say non-autistic kids, kids that aren't on the spectrum, would not be attracted for similar reasons. Because, you know, there's non-autistic kids that have trouble bonding and, you know, being friendly and may feel a wee bit lonely, if we're perfectly honest with you, during the early years. And if a group present themselves to them, 
as welcoming, etc., then they could be drawn in. I totally understand that. Um, and then a couple of nights ago, I was in again another Twitter space, and there was a transgender person who, born male, presented as female, got involved with the discussion. And I found some of the things they said a wee bit strange and, you know, asked them for some input, some feedback. Um, and I found the conversation a bit bizarre because when you talk to someone, as I do, and you have a conversation and it's relaxed and you ask people open questions and give you fulfilling answers, then that's normal. That's how people interact. But I found there was a sort of checking my answers first by this other person before they said anything and trying to remember what the manifesto was to their campaign before they gave any um, concrete answers. And one of, the, one of the, the bizarre things was someone else in the chat asked them what, a, what their understanding of what a woman was, and we get quite a protracted answer, which was a bit woolly, to be honest with you. And then I asked a question. I said, well, what is transgender? And I got quite a waffled response to that as well. So I've heard a lot of people say that people who are transgender and transgender activists or allies, as they, they, they call some of them, um, often struggle with what a woman is question. But what I seen in front of me was a transgender person struggling with what is transgender. And they seem unable to define either of those things. And then I asked, well, what is the difference between a transvestite and transgender and was told that's a man that wants to wear women's, wear women's clothes and then I asked well do the transgender men so there's people who are born male that are transgender wear women's clothes well yes so what's the difference well that's just down to time apparently because transgender people wear clothes to suit all the time whereas transvestites only do it sometimes. So now that leaves me with the thought that the only difference between a transvestite and a transgender, majority of transgender people, is timing. So is a transgender person just a full-time transvestite? Or is a transvestite just a part-time transgender? So although this journey has, has answered quite a lot of questions that I've had and it's been interesting and um, <clears throat> I feel worthwhile, try to educate myself on the topic, it's actually opened up a lot more questions. And it's what do transgender people actually want? And why? And I believe, I genuinely believe that quite a lot of people out there that identify themselves as transgender are actually victims of a campaign. And I spoke to uh, another uh, lesbian who I've not done a podcast with yet girl from Newcastle who was banned from a football club for three years from going and supporting a football club. And I asked her her opinions on it. Um, and she made a very, very valid point. Now, and I'm, something that will just stay with me. And she said, she is a 30-something lesbian happy with life. Quite content with, you know, what she's got in life apart from being barred from her favourite football team. But she fears that if her, when she was, say, eight-year-old, she's just said, she described that she used to play like princes and princesses with other wee girls and she always wanted to be the prince and she liked football and what we'd probably have the term, term at the time as a tomboy. And she's now happy with where she is in life. And her fear is for her eight-year-old self, if her eight-year-old self was eight years old today, that would have been grabbed on, pounced on, and she would suddenly have been told that she should consider or can consider being transgender and how her life may have been different if she ended up down the puberty blockers and potential um, medical um, surgery, etc. And it frightens her life out of her. So she is sort of driven by trying to protect kids who don't need this flung in their, their face. We're sexualising young people. We are putting people in, in situations where um, it's dangerous. And it just beggars 
belief. I'm glad I set out in this little journey. The, I'm much more learned about the topic today than I was two months ago. And no doubt I'll be more learned in another two months. But, and I can't thank enough the people that have helped me understand what's going on there, what's going on out there. Because this whole thing has simply been driven by greed. That's what it is. A simple notion of greed. Where people built an industry with a goal, achieved their goal, and then realised the money's going to stop. So we need new aims, we need new goals. And that new aim and that new goal was to normalise transgender. And it's now jeopardising the safety of kids all up and down the country. Just one other thing I want to share with you that I th from probably a couple of years ago that I stumbled on. And it was a video of a man, who I now know actually, a man called Richard Lucas, who is the leader of the Scottish Family Party. And I didn't know Richard at the time. I've only known Richard a matter of months. But I saw a video of him on social media where he was in a sort of town hall setting where John Swinney was speaking at an event. And he challenged him. He was the um, education minister from memory at the time. And Richard challenged him with a load of information about what was being taught in our curriculum, about sex education, etc., and the normalisation of it. And it was disgusting. And I genuinely thought Richard Lucas was a lunatic because I didn't believe what he was saying. I thought there is no way in this day and age we are teaching what this man claims in our schools. He must be a crackpot. And it turns out Richard Lucas was correct. And I was a crackpot for my opening my ears and my mind to him years ago when I had the chance. And if you listen to the things I've been talking to parents about, and asking them what advice would they give to other parents. And it is challenge the curriculum. Be very, very wary of your child's online behaviour and what they're involved in because that is a mad cesspit of information. We have people who are encouraging kids to self-harm, encouraging kids to mutilate themselves, encourage children to take drugs that can actually um, chemically castrate them. That's all there. You can find it on the internet easily and kids are drawn into it. And some kids are more vulnerable than others. As I've already discussed, autistic kids seem to have an unusually high amount of proportion involved in the trans movement. So, if you have children or you just care for society, please be wary. Please open your eyes. <clears throat> but more importantly, open your mind. And if you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you haven't already done so, please consider subscribing to the channel. But most importantly of all, unless you're one of these people who want to drive transgenderism down everyone else's throat, unless you're one of these people who financially gain from the heartache you're causing society, unless you're one of these people that want to dance in the streets and make an arse of yourself. Everyone else, have a great day. Cheerio bye now.